Today we're going to talk about Gauss's Law, uh, but before we can understand Gauss's Law, we have to understand a couple of mathematical principles. I, I'm kind of a believer in just-in-time learning on mathematical principles, so we're going to talk about surface integrals and divergence of a vector field first. Both concepts that you've probably seen before, but, but it, it'll be good to have a refresher. And then we're going to see some examples of Gauss's Law. We're going to go into some fairly simple examples today, and then in Chapter 6 it'll be uh, all solid uh, geometry, all, all, all the real-world examples of Gauss's Law that you can handle. I uh, just wanted to take a minute and observe that the person who came up with Gauss's Law, of course, was Gauss, um, but you may not know about him. He was a, a, probably one of the greatest mathematicians and physicists in history. And of course, when there's Isaac Newton, uh, who really pretty much invented physics and calculus, you always have to say one of in front of anybody else, but it, it kind of goes Newton and then Gauss, I think. Uh, he really did make contributions in a, in a remarkable breadth of fields. You know, back in the 17, 1800s, early 1800s, uh, things were still pretty new, and you could make uh, ad advances in a lot of different fields. And, and in particular, he has both uh, Gauss's Law, which is one of the most important equations in all of electromagnetic fields, as well as the Gaussian distribution, which you probably refer to as the normal distribution, but the most important probability distribution, both of them are named after him. And so when you, and plus he has a, a, an SI unit of, of electromagnetic field uh, strength. So you get the feeling that he was a pretty substantial uh, contributor to this field. So, like I said, we're going to talk about a couple of mathematical principles first. Rather than putting all the math at the beginning, I'm trying to, to squeeze it in only where necessary. And the first of these principles is the concept of a surface integral. So a surface integral is anytime that you have a field, uh, and, in, and in this case we're sort of showing a, a vector field. Whoops. Let me try to undo that and get my pen going here. going to go red and three-quarter thickness. There we go. Okay, so anytime that you have a vector field, and this is sort of what the vector field is shown here, uh, anytime that you want to know how much of that vector field penetrates through a particular surface. That surface could be a, a circle, it could be a square, it could be a rectangle, a triangle, it could even be a cylinder or a sphere. Uh, a surface integral is going to be what you're going to need to use. And so you can see that there is this one red vector, ds, and that ds is, is really what we're trying to show is, is perpendicular to the surface. So ds is associated with the surface, f is associated with the vector field. And if you simply take the dot product of ds with f and then take an integral of that over the surface, then you get this, which is, which is our concept of the surface integral. So the surface integral is going to allow us to calculate how much of f passes through that, that limited surface ds. You can think of it this way, you know, imagine if you, uh, if, if you wanted to, if you're on a desert island and you want to collect as much rain as possible, you want a big bucket but you want to hold that bucket so that the surface of the bucket is perpendicular to the rain flow. And that's really the, the, the image that's shown in figure 5.1. If you held the bucket sideways, no rain would go in. Uh, in the same way that in theory, if rain is falling vertically straight downward, no rain would actually go through an open window. But of course there's wind and so the rain can blow through an open window, so that can be problematic. But what we also find is that there are certain circumstances where the rain is diagonal, uh, or where the field is diagonal relative to the surface. And so you can see here the ds, this ds, is still going to be perpendicular to the surface. ds is always perpendicular to the surface, but in this case f is now diagonal. When we take the dot product between f and ds, we're going to find that only a portion of the f is actually going to correspond to going through the surface. And as a result, the dot product will be smaller, and the surface integral will also be smaller. Now this picture is, is uh, designed to show that if you have a curved surface, and here we're looking at a side view of the curved surface, if there is a curved surface then the ds is going to be perpendicular at every point of that curved surface. And so you can see that whereas the, the f field is, is all pointing in the same direction, and relative to the middle of this part, it, it's pretty well uh, parallel with ds, and so therefore there's going to be some really good amount of that vector that's passing through the field, but over here it's not parallel to this part. And so the dot product is going to be different there. It's going to be less than 1. And so we're going to find that, that we need to account for the shape of the surface. The surface is not necessarily flat. It, it will often be cylindrical or spherical. And so when we're doing a surface integral, we need to be aware of that. 
Uh, one other thing to know is that uh, when doing a surface integral, by far the most important type of a surface integral is a closed surface integral. So of course a closed surface is one that separates or partitions off a piece of space. Think of this as like a sphere or a cube or a pyramid. Those would all separate off a piece of space and so, so that it wouldn't be available to the other portions of space. And if you have a surface integral with a closed surface, we add a little circle around the, around the, the surface integral just to represent the fact that it is, in fact, a closed surface. And just be aware that when you're working with a closed integral, the surface vector ds always points out. It never points into the surface. It always points out. Um, and if the closed surface has several flat sides to it, think of this as like a cube or, uh, you know, or like a, a, an eight-sided shape or something like that. If it has a number of flat sides, then you need to account for all of the sides. And so you can see here in, in this figure 5.4, I'm showing the, the six sides of a cube. You need to be prepared for calculating the, the component of, of the surface integral that's on each of those six sides. Sometimes a few of them will be zero. Uh, for example, if, if you have a vector field that is, that is point, pointing straight downward, well, then it's gonna, none of it's going to go through the right or the left or the front or the back. You'll only need to worry about the top surface and the bottom surface. Uh, but in, in that case, uh, it would simplify the problem because you would have uh, only two of the six sides to account for. We'll see an example of that in here in just a minute. Okay, it's time for some examples. Calculate the surface integral of this of this vector field with the surface that's shown. So the surface that we've chosen is in the xy plane. Notice then that z is equal to zero for that plane. And I'm going to choose, uh, you know, because it's not a closed surface, the, the perpendicular vector could be pointing up or it could be pointing down. I'm going to choose it to be pointing up. So that's in the positive a sub z direction. So if I want to take the surface integral, and I'm going to take this over a delta s of f dot ds. This is going to be a double integral. And the integral is going to be of f 2 a sub x plus 3 a sub y plus 4 a sub z dotted with, what did we say that, that uh, ds was? Well, ds is right here. This is ds. And so this is a dot product with a sub z. And what are the what are the the integration variables? Well, I'm going to integrate with respect to this direction, and I'm going to integrate with respect to this direction. And so there's an integration with respect to x, and there's an integration with respect to y. You can do them in either order. I'm going to go ahead and do y first. So it's dy. Oh, did I make a mistake there? No. Yeah, it's correct. dy dx, and then I'm going to take the limit as y equals zero. Notice that y goes all the way over to two, so it goes up to two. And then x equals 0, x only goes to 1, so there's a 1 right there. Now when I take the dot product of a sub x dotted with a sub z, well, that's, that, those are perpendicular, so the dot product is going to be equal to 0, so this term is going to go away. When I take the dot product of a sub y with a sub z perpendicular, that term goes away. When I take the dot product of a sub z with a sub z, remember that a sub z has a unit length so when I take those uh, dot product with each with itself, I just get one. So therefore, this becomes a double integral of just four. Four times dy dx. This four becomes that four. And so this will be from zero to two and from zero to one. Well, that's just a constant. So the integral of four dy dx is about as simple as an integral as I could do. This is going to end up being four times uh, y evaluated between 0 and 2 multiplied by x evaluated between 0 and 1, which is 4 times 2 times 1, which is just 8. So the surface integral, it, it, even when the geometry gets more complicated, it's still going to be the same steps. Identify what is the vector field, identify what is the perpendicular, uh, what is the, the ds, the perpendicular vector, dot product them together, then take the surface integral, or just then take the double integral. So let's calculate this one. We have a more complicated case now because the, the, the x, y, and z components vary with x, y, and z. We've also we're also taking a slightly different uh, uh, surface here. I'm going to go ahead and, and again choose this surface to be pointing in this direction. That's the a sub y surface. Um, and I'm going to say that the double integral over delta s of f dot ds is going to be, there are two integrals, 
I'm going to I'm going to say then this is going to be f y times a sub x plus z times a sub y plus x times a sub z dotted with ds. What did we say ds was? ds is a sub y. So dotted with a sub y. And then the two the two variables of integration, I'm going to have an x and I'm going to have a z. And I could do them again in either order. I'm going to go ahead and do dz dx. So then this is uh, z equals 0 up to 1. And this is x equals 0 up to 1. OK, again, the a sub y dotted with a, a sub x dotted with a sub y gives me 0. a sub z dotted with a sub y gives me 0. And a sub y dotted with itself, a sub y dotted with a sub y is just equal to 1. So therefore, this is a double integral of just z, z dz dx. So not quite as simple as the last one, but still it's not going to be too bad. Uh, we're going to see then this is going to be an integral from 0 to 1 of z squared over 2 uh, evaluated between 0 and 1. And then we still have to integrate with respect to x. So this becomes, the, the integral of z is just z squared over 2. Uh, evaluated at 1, that becomes 1 half minus 0. So this is the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 half dx, which it turns out is just 1 half times 1, which is just 1 half. So neither of those problems was terribly hard. Let's look at one that's a little bit more challenging. Now we're going to have to calculate the closed surface integral. So now I'm going to calculate a closed surface integral over delta s of f dot ds. And notice here that uh, we have chosen a cube, and so there are six sides to account for. And we need to account for all six of those sides uh, in, our, in our calculation. Now it turns out that some of those sides are going to be easier than others. Because let's, let's take a minute here and, and look at the function itself. Notice that the, the z component is constant. That means that 2, I'm going to erase these arrows just to try to make my life a little bit easier here and make it a little bit clearer for you because i got a lot to write here. This 2 is going to be flowing in from the bottom, and it's also going to be flowing out of the top. And it doesn't really matter. It's going to be 2 across the entire width and breadth of that. It's going to be 2 the whole way. So if I, if I look at the top, the top, the surface integral there, and interestingly, because that's a constant, the surface integral really just becomes a, a, a multiplication. So it just becomes 2 multiplied by the surface area of the top, which is 3 times 3. That's 9 times 2 is 18. But if you look at the bottom, notice that in, on the top, of course, they were all flowing upward, and so flowing out of the cube. But in the bottom, now they're flowing into the cube, and anything flowing into the cube is negative. This is minus 2 times 3 times 3, which is negative 18. So what this tells me is that the top and the bottom cancel each other. That's very important. That means that, that we can include the top and bottom, but, but I didn't actually even need to calculate the positive and negative 18. If I just knew that they were equal and opposite, that would have been enough. Let's consider the left side. So on the left side, what do we know about the left side? Again, I'm going to erase here. On the left side, we know that y is equal to 0. So right here, we know that y is equal to 0. So y is equal to 0 there. Now, if I look at the, the, the only component that would, be, that would be pushing through that side is pointing in the a sub y direction. Right, this is, this is in the a sub y direction. Similarly, on the right side, there's going to be some that, that's going to be coming out the right side that's in that same direction. But let's look at this, let's look at this, this a sub y. The a sub y is going to tell me that the y component, a capital A sub y, is just equal to y, which on this, in this, on this left side is equal to 0. So that tells me that, that whatever else is going on with the x component and the z component, there is nothing that is going to be pushing through that left-hand side. Because since y is equal to 0, we know that a sub y is equal to 0, where this, this, by the way, this is what we'll refer to as a sub y. This is a sub x. 
and this is a sub z. That's simply the components in each of those three directions. Since a sub y is equal to zero, and since that's the only part that's gonna be pushing through the left-hand side, we know that the left-hand side, the, the, the surface integral, whoops, that's not a closed surface integral, it's just the surface integral on the left is equal to zero. Similarly on the bottom, on the bottom we can see that z is equal to zero, and since, um, let's see, on the bottom, the only, oh, we've already done the bottom, sorry about that. I, what I meant was the back. So on the back, we can see that x is equal to zero, and therefore the x component, a sub x is equal to x is equal to zero. That means that whatever's going on in the back here, nothing is pushing through that wall. Not, not, no part of the vector is going to penetrate through that surface, and therefore the double integral along the back is equal to zero. So we've got four of the six sides, we've already done the work, and, and two of them cancel and two of them are zero. So let's look at the front side. The front side is not gonna be zero and it's not gonna cancel. So along the front side, we have to do a double integral. Of course, it's gonna be an integral from zero to three and from zero to three uh, and it's going to be of the vector. Oh, interestingly, on the front side, so on the front side, x is equal to three. Across the entire front of this cube, x is equal to three. So rather than saying x a sub x, I can just say three a sub x plus y a sub y plus two a sub z dotted with now what is gonna be the, the vector that's coming out of the cube on the front surface? Well, coming out of the cube on the front surface, that's gonna be in the a sub x direction. So I'm gonna say dot a sub x. And then the integration, the integration is gonna be along the, the two edges here. So it's gonna be, that's in the y direction, and this is in the z direction. So this is dy dz. Okay, a sub x dotted with a sub x, we know that's just gonna be one. a sub y dotted with a sub x is zero. a sub z dotted with a sub x is zero. And so what I end up with is a double integral from zero to three for both variables of three dy dz, which it turns out is again a very simple integral, it just turns out to be three, whoops, that's a very big three. 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. And then you can probably see the pattern here, the right side. Uh, notice, by the way, that on the right side, this entire right surface here, along the right side, y is equal to 3, along that entire surface. So this integral, which is going to go from 0 to 3 and 0 to 3, Uh, is going to be of x a sub x plus, now instead of y a sub y, I'm gonna say three a sub y plus two a sub z dotted with, and what vector is coming out of this surface? It's an a sub y, so we have a sub y. So a sub x dotted with a sub y is zero, a sub z dotted with a sub y is zero, so I end up with a double integral from, z oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot something here. I forgot that uh, I need to include the, d the d's. So this is gonna be in the dx direction, and this is in the dz direction. So it's dx dz. So this is the double integral from zeros to threes of three dx dz, which is again, three times three times three, which is again, 27. And so then finally, almost off the bottom of the page here, the closed surface integral over that surface of f dot ds is going to be, I'll go ahead and include them all, 18 minus 18 plus zero plus zero plus 27 plus 27. Those cancel, I suppose those don't count, and that gives us that the closed integral is 54. That's about as hard as a closed integral is going to get in this class. Uh, I'm not going to make them be this hard once we get into doing electro, uh, electromagnetic fields, but I think that it's good to see 
uh, you know, a really detailed surface integral problem. Just wanted to also mention that we saw in chapter two uh, equations for the surface areas uh, in cylindrical coordinates and spherical coordinates. And I just wanted to remind you of what those were and remind you that at the time I said, these will come in handy. Uh, and today is the day that at least some of them are going to come in handy. Because let's calculate the closed surface integral of the following vector field in spherical coordinates. So these, by the way, are spherical coordinates. And although I already scrolled them off the page, uh, whoop, these are cylindrical coordinates. So we're going to be using the second set of equations there uh, to, to be able to figure out what is going to be the, the surface integral of this problem. So closed surface integral of the following vector field in spherical coordinates with a sphere of radius 1 centered at the origin. So I'm not sure that the picture is going to help very much, but let me just go ahead and draw it. We've got a sphere of radius 1, and it's centered at the origin. Okay, so like I said, I'm not sure that that picture helped very much. What we want is to do a closed surface integral um, of, whoops, of f, I guess in this case it's a. The, there is nothing magical about the name of the vector field. Uh, in this case, it's just a. This is going to be equal to a double integral of a, which is 1 over 4 pi r squared a sub r, um, dotted with, and now there are going to be three components. Um, the, but the one that we care about is this one right here. This one right here is the one that really makes a difference because, as you can probably already see from the pattern, a sub r right here is going to is going to cancel with a sub theta and it's going to cancel with a sub phi. So we don't really need to write those two out, but we do need to write out the other one. So it's r squared times the sine of theta times and I'm I'm going to do d phi first. You can do them in either order and then d theta and then there's an a sub r. And you might wonder what about this plus or minus? Well, we've accounted for that by saying that the vector will always point outward from the surface. So we don't need to worry about, about the plus and minus there. We're going to take the plus because we're going to be looking at it going outward. A sub r with a sub r dots together to just form one. And so we end up with, oh, and I should, oh, the integral limits are important here. I'm going to take the integral limit. This is really hard to represent in, in two dimensions. But what I want you to think about is we're picture a globe and we're going to go around the, the equator of the globe, right? And so we're going to say phi, phi equals 0 up to 2 pi. That's going around the full equator of the globe. And now I want you to put your hands in a circle around the equator of the globe. And I want you to rotate them 180 degrees around the globe. And if you do that, you will have touched every point along the globe. Now, if you went 360 degrees, you would actually touch each point twice. And I know that this is, this is hard to describe when we're not in person, and it's even hard to describe when we are in person, but theta doesn't go to 2 pi, theta only goes to pi. Because if you have the equator of the globe and you sweep that around 180 degrees, you will have covered every square inch of the globe. And so these are the limits on, on, on phi and theta. So this becomes a double integral from 0 to 2 pi, and from 0 to pi of, and now let's see, the r squared is going to cancel with this r squared. That's a happy coincidence. Oh, and I can put the 1 over 4 pi out in front. So 1 over 4 pi is going to go out in front. Uh, and then we're going to have an integral of sine theta d phi d theta. And so everything else has really gone away. Notice that the first integration, the inner, you always do the inner integration first. The inner integration is with respect to phi, and nothing inside the integral depends on phi. So that's going to actually be quite a simple integral. It's going to be just 2 pi. Uh, 2 pi divided by 4 pi, and we're left with only one integral. And that is from 0 up to pi of sine theta d theta. Well, the, sin, the integral of the sine of theta is negative cosine of theta. So this becomes, oh, and I should say this cancels with this. This cancels and leaves only a 2. So this is equal to 1 half times minus cosine of theta evaluated between 0 and pi. And this then is minus 1 half, and I brought this minus sign out here. Uh, cosine of pi in radians, it turns out, is negative 1. 
uh, and then we say minus whatever the cosine of zero is. Well, the cosine of zero is also one, and so this becomes negative a half times negative two, which is just one. So the surface integral of that calculation was just one. So that's pretty much everything you need to know about surface integrals for this class. Let's talk a little bit about divergence. Now divergence is one of the, the three main uh, aspects of partial derivatives with vector calculus that we're going to use. We'll introduce the gradient and the curl when you need them, but for right now, you're just going to need to know about the divergence. The divergence of a vector field is written most compactly as the dot product between the del operator. And the del operator is really just an upside down uh, delta. Uh, the del operator and the, the vector field that's being considered. So here's the definition of the del operator. And the del operator by itself doesn't seem to make very much sense. But it turns out that it is a very compact way of representing uh, the three, or actually there are kind of three and a half. We'll, we'll talk about the Laplacian as well. But there are three big ones and, and then sort of a junior partner uh, in, in vector calculus, in partial derivative vector calculus. And, and the del operator allows us very compact ways of representing each of those. What we do for the divergence is we take del dotted with a. So we take that del operator that we just saw, and then we take the, the a vector, and again, we're using capital A sub x to represent the x component, capital A sub y for the y component, and capital A sub z for the z component. When we dot these together, of course, with three times three, there would be nine combinations, but only three of those nine combinations are non-zero, because it's only gonna be when this term pairs with this term that it will be non-zero, and I get from that the partial derivative of a sub x with respect to x. And if I had a different color pen, I would use that. I'll instead use a square. And I'll say when this term dots with this term, I get this term. And I, I guess, OK, parallelogram it is. So when you dot this one with this one, you get this term right here. Um, and so what we find then is that the divergence of, of any vector field is just the sum of the three partial derivatives of the components taken with respect to that particular direction. So partial of a sub x with respect to x, plus partial of a sub y with respect to y, plus partial of a sub z with respect to z. That's not going to make a lot of sense until you actually see an example. So we're going to see an example here in a second. But let me first of all explain that the divergence, which we could call del dot a, but, but you really don't call it del dot a. We refer to it as the divergence. The divergence of a can also be, for reasons that are sort of beyond the, the time that we have available, it is, it's also equal to the limit of an infinitesimally small volume where you take the surface integral of that, of that infinitesimally small volume and you divide it by the small volume. What this really gives us is the sources and the sinks of the vector field. So if there is vector field flowing away from a point, that would be the source. If there's vector field flowing toward a point, uniformly toward a point, that would be the sink of it. What we want to see is, is this, remember that, that if you have a surface, whatever this surface looks like, anything pointing out of it is going to be positive. Anything pointing into it is going to be negative. So if you have a positive surface integral, then you're going to have a positive divergence. And if you have a positive divergence, then that's going to be the source of the vector field. And if it's flowing in, then that's going to be negative and negative of the divergence, and that's going to be a sink of the vector field. I think that all of this will make a little bit more sense after we've seen a couple of examples. So let's look at an example here. Oh, and I, I, one thing I should mention, if the divergence is zero at that particular point, then there's neither a, a, a source nor a sink of the vector field at that point. And most of space is neither a source nor a sink of whatever vector field we're looking at. So most of space, the divergence will be zero. But the interesting parts that we care about, they're, they're going to be non-zero. So let's look at an example here of calculating the divergence. We have a pretty complicated uh, vector function here, vector field here. And so what I want is the divergence of A. By the way, the, the uh, del operator is actually a vector, so I am representing it with a vector notation here. This is going to be the partial of A sub x with respect to x plus the partial of A sub y with respect to y plus the partial of A sub z with respect to z, which is the partial with respect to x of the x component, which is 3xy, plus the partial with respect to y of the y component, which is just y, 
plus the partial with respect to z of the z component, which is actually negative 4xy e to the minus z. Notice that the divergence is not a vector. The divergence is going to end up just being a, a function which plugged in at a certain point is just going to be equal to a number. So the divergence of a in this case, when I take the partial derivative of 3xy, I just get 3y, because you treat y as a constant. Uh, when you're doing a partial derivative, you teach, treat every other variable as a constant. So 3, 3 and y are both constants there. Plus, when you take the partial of y with respect to y, you just get 1. Plus, OK, I'm taking the partial with respect to z. So I'm going to have minus 4xy. Those are all constants. And the derivative of e to the minus z with respect to z is just minus 1 times e to the minus z. So this is 3y plus 1 plus 4xy e to the minus z. And that's the divergence at every point. But I was asked to find the divergence of a at 0, 0, 0. And to do that, I just plug in x, y, and z to all be 0. So this is 3 times 0 plus 1 plus 4 times 0 times 0 times e to the minus 0. Well, that just gives me 0 plus 4 plus 0, which is 4. And it turns out that because this is a positive number, this is a source. If that had turned out to be a negative number, then it would have been a sink. Oh, I made a mistake there. Huh. OK, nope, I, no, no mistake. My only mistake was in doubting my own, my own solution. OK, so now we've done the boring stuff. We've, we've done the mathematical foundations necessary to understand Gauss's law. We're going to take just a couple of minutes and talk about Gauss's law, because, because Gauss's law is really no more than the, than the combination of two facts that we've already learned. We understand that the divergence allows us to calculate sources and sinks. And when we talked about electric fields, we saw that charges, electric charges, are sources and sinks of electric fields. So what we want to say is that the divergence of the electric field, which is to say sources and sinks of the electric field, come from charges. So the, 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 if positive charges, then it'll be a source. If negative charges, then it'll be a sink. You might say, where did this epsilon 0 come from? That looks familiar. We had it in Coulomb, Coulomb's law. So epsilon zero is, exists because of the particular units that we've chosen. You know, we, we chose a certain set of units for rho sub v. We chose a certain set of units for e. Uh, those were somewhat arbitrary choices, and we could have chosen different ones. This constant epsilon zero really incorporates those decisions that we already made. And it, it also kind of, you could think of it as saying, hey, you've got this charge. How much electric field comes out of the charge? I understand that it flows out of a positive charge and it flows into a negative charge, but how much? And that really is the question that's answered by epsilon zero. How much? Especially how much within light of the particular, uh, 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 particular units that we've chosen for E and rho sub v. So really, this is known, by the way, as the point form of Gauss's law because we can evaluate it at every possible point. The point form of Gauss's law is really just a combination of the fact that the divergence gives us sources and sinks, and charge densities are sources and sinks of electric fields. Now there's also a second form of Gauss's law, and that second form of Gauss's law is known as the integral form of Gauss's law. And this is because it doesn't, it doesn't work on a point-by-point -point basis, it works on a region of space. And so that region of space is, is going to uh, be a certain volume. And so we're going we're gonna to take a surface integral over that certain region of space. And that surface integral, which is the integral of e dot ds, is going to be, uh, think of it as like a sphere. And if there are arrows pointing out of that sphere, if there are uniformly electric fields pointing out of that sphere, the only way that that could happen is if there are charges inside of that sphere. And so we're saying how much charge is enclosed inside of that sphere or inside of that cylinder or that cube or that dodecahedron, whatever shape we've chosen, uh, whatever that, that charge is, divided by, again, our friend epsilon 0, for the same reason that it existed in equation 5.6, it also exists in equation 5.7. Whatever the surface integral of E dot ds is, that's going to depend on Q enclosed. If, if there are vectors pointing uniformly into uh, the sphere, then you must know that there's going to be negative charges inside that sphere where the, the electric fields can terminate upon. You know, one way to think about this would be if you had a cave or if you had a house with only one door and no windows, and there is light coming out of the entrance, 
The only way that that could happen is if there is a light source inside of there. Obviously light can't shine com coming through the walls, so it has to be coming from inside. Now, if, if you add windows, then it can get, get to be more complex. You could say, well, maybe light's coming in from the, for, through the windows and it's coming out through the door. That's true, but the calculations that we're going to be doing will allow for negative, uh, it's going to allow for the, um, the vectors pointing in to be negative and vectors pointing out to be positive so that they can actually cancel each other out. Light coming in through a window and out through a door or in through a window and out through another window would cancel each other out. Now, the thing to know about Gauss's Law, and if there's really only one thing you would remember from today, it's this next thing. The most important thing to know about Gauss's Law is that it is primarily, and I'm going to say really for us, only useful in cases where there is a very high level of symmetry in the geometry of the problem. So that could be a sphere, it could be a cylinder, it could be an infinite plane. Anytime that there is a, lo a lot of symmetry, you're going to find that, that it, we're going to be able to use a, a Gauss's law to calculate the electric fields. Remember last time we saw that it was a lot of work to calculate one dimensional electric fields or electric fields due to one dimensional shapes. It was even more work to calculate electric fields due to two dimensional shapes and we didn't even try with three dimensional shapes. But today we're going to be able to do three dimensional shapes quite easily by applying Gauss's law. Now part of Gauss's law is that we need to, calc we need to uh, use what's called a Gaussian surface. And this phrase Gaussian surface really scared me when I was a student. What I want you to know is that there is nothing special about a Gaussian surface other than that it is a closed surface. That's the only thing that makes a surface Gaussian is that if it's closed. So a sphere is a Gaussian surface and a cube and a pyramid and you know I think of every every die in a role-playing game. Those are all closed surfaces. Those are all going to be uh, Gaussian surfaces. Now some Gaussian surfaces are better than others. Uh, for a particular problem, what you want to do is you want to choose a surface, so choose a surface whose symmetry matches the symmetry of the problem itself. So if your problem, the problem that you're given has a sphere, choose a sphere for the Gaussian surface. And if your problem has a cylinder, choose a cylinder for the Gaussian surface. There will be some problems where the shape doesn't really matter, but in, some, in a lot of problems it, it, it will matter an awful lot. But the interesting thing is that if you do choose a, a, a surface such that the electric field, the electric field across each side is either constant or zero. And if you are clever enough to choose a surface that is that, is that, 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 that obeys that rule, then let me just flip back up here reminding you that this used to be a surface integral. Equation 5.7 used to be a surface integral and it still is because this surface integral over a closed surface, also known as a Gaussian surface, the integral of e dot ds, if in fact the, the electric field is constant across the entire surface, all you have to do is multiply that electric field by the surface area. So that means that a problem that would have ordinarily required us to either use the point form and use partial derivatives or use the integral form which would have required a surface integral, we can actually get away with just multiplication. And that's going to make our lives so much easier. Um, Gauss's law has a reputation among students as being very difficult. It's one of the reasons why we're breaking it up into two chapters. But my opinion is that Gauss's law is one of the easiest topics we see in this class because it just involves multiplication and division. No integral, no, no partial derivative or anything. You might say, well then why did you spend the first half of today's lesson talking about those things? Because I needed you to understand the foundation so that you would really appreciate uh, that, that when we get to this point, we don't have to do those things. We will come back and use divergence and we will come back and use surface integrals again. But for today, we can get away with just multiplication. And since what we're mostly going to have is problems where we're given the charge density and we're asked to calculate the electric field, this version, 5.9, is the master equation. This is the one that we're going to be using to solve essentially every Gauss's Law problem that we're going to see in this class. So having seen that, or having talked about that, let's just briefly mention that there are two types of Gauss's Law problems. There are problems with hollow shapes and there are problems with solid shapes. Now obviously there's no such thing as a truly hollow shape. You know, even if you take a basketball, the, the wall of the basketball has thickness. If you take a soap bubble, the soap, the soap bubble has thickness. But we can approximate each of those as if they were hollow spheres. Now you couldn't approximate a basket, uh, you couldn't approximate a, a baseball or a golf ball as a hollow sphere because they're solid spheres. Well, it turns out that solid spheres are, are more challenging to work with. They're also more realistic. They're also more important. But for today, day one of Gauss's law, we're just going to be talking about hollow shapes. 
Tomorrow, next time, chapter six, we'll talk about solid shapes. So consider a hollow sphere of radius A and a total charge of Q spread across the entire surface of the sphere. What is the electric field at any point inside the sphere? So it always helps to draw a picture. So I always draw my the geometry of the shape itself, and that's supposed to be a circle. I draw that as a solid circle, and I'm gonna go ahead and indicate that this has a radius of A and it has a total charge of plus Q on the on the surface of the sphere. So again, think basketball here. This is a hollow sphere. Then I always draw my Gauss's, Gaussian surface with a dotted line. Now, I'm sorry, I am the furthest thing from an artist, but that's supposed to be also a sphere. We're, we're kind of looking at a, a side view of the sphere here, and it's supposed to be concentric, having the same center as the original sphere. What that means is that there's going to be a great deal of symmetry between the original problem geometry and the Gaussian surface. I'm going to say that this Gaussian surface has a radius of r, and r has to be less than a according to the problem statement, so I've drawn, the, I've drawn this correctly. So let's go ahead and apply what we know. e is equal to q enclosed divided by a times epsilon zero. How much charge is enclosed inside of that Gaussian surface? How much charge is enclosed in this region here? None. There is no charge enclosed in that region inside of that inner sphere, and so therefore the electric field is equal to zero. It's, at equal, to, it's equal to zero at every point inside the sphere. That's a really remarkable thing. If you think about trying to do this math, uh, our, our original math, we might have been able to figure out what was at the dead solid center of the sphere. But I'm saying that even if you have like a little point right here, well, there's a very strong electric field that's coming from the points on the, on the sphere right there, but, and there are weaker points coming from over here, but they always perfectly cancel each other out. It's amazing to me that in a calculation as simple as this one, we were able to get a result that is so profound to say that no matter where we are inside of that sphere, there will absolutely be no electric field anywhere inside of the sphere. So now that we know that the electric field inside of the sphere is equal to zero, the question is, of course, what is the electric field outside of the sphere? So here I've got uh, that the radius is less than a, but up here now, I'm going to consider what is what is the radius outside of A? What happens if what happens if I have a sphere? So here is my metal sphere, which is in the original problem, and it has a radius of A and it has a plus Q on it. But I'm now going to consider what's happening outside of that metal sphere. So I've kind of zoomed out and made the metal metal sphere smaller. I'm now going to have this radius R right here. What happens if R is greater than A? Well, I know that I, I need to calculate the electric field is the enclosed charge divided by A times epsilon zero. I also know that because there are positive charges on this sphere um, and because of the symmetry of the problem, the electric field lines are going to be pointing away from the sphere in every direction. In fact, they're perpendicular to the sphere in every direction. And in fact, that's the reason why we can do a multiplication rather than just simply an, a, a simple multiplication rather than a full integration. So how much charge is contained inside of our Gaussian surface? Well, we, con we contain the full plus Q, right? That plus Q represents the amount of charge that's on the, on the metal surface or on the surface of the problem statement. Our Gaussian surface contains that entire sphere, so therefore it contains the entire charge. Uh, what is the area? of a sphere, by the way, the area of a sphere is going to be 4 pi r squared. That's a good thing for you to have uh, at your fingertips. So the area of our Gaussian surface here, so let me just say this is always going to be the area of the Gaussian surface is going to be 4 pi r squared times epsilon 0. And so I can rewrite this as Q divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 times, oh, times lowercase r squared. And if that result looks familiar to you, it's because that's Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law can actually be derived from Gauss's law, which means that Gauss's law is the more fundamental of the two laws. In fact, everything in electrostatics can be derived from Gauss's law. In fact, Gauss's law is one of the four fundamental equations of electromagnetic field theory. They're known as Maxwell's equations. 
And Maxwell's equations, there are, there are four of them. There's a point form and an integral form of each of them, just as we saw there's a point form and an integral form of Gauss's law. And up here, I just want to mention, this is an early form, and I should clarify, there's, there's going to be an improvement that we're going to see to this later on when we talk about solid material. But this is an early form of one of Maxwell's equations, one of the four. And, and so we've got, a, we, we got a lot of ground to cover, but right here in lesson five, we've already seen one of the four uh, fundamental laws of ele electromagnetic field theory. What is the electric field at a distance z above an infinite plane of charge with a charge density of rho sub s? So let's consider, and I can't draw an infinite plane of charge on a finite tablet, so I'm just going to draw it this way. I know that the charge density is plus rho sub s. I know that the electric field is going to point away in both directions because, of course, electric field lines always point away from positive charges. I want to think about now, and I could draw a circle, I could draw a rectangle, I could draw a square. I'm going to draw a square, but it could be the same, and I'm going to take it down here, and again, I'm going to apologize for my lack of artistic skills, um, but... But this is, uh, this is going to penetrate uh, the surface. Oh, sorry about that. So this is going to penetrate the surface of this. There we go. And so you can see that the, the, because this is a rectangle, I'm going to call the top ha having surface S, the part that it penetrates on the, on, the, on the plane as having a surface of S, and the bottom as having a surface of S. Now the electric fields that are going vertical here, they aren't going to touch the left, the right, the back, and the front walls. They're only going to poke through the top wall and they're, and they're going to poke through the bottom wall. So we only need to worry about the top and the bottom. And let's see, what is the electric field? The electric field is going to be the enclosed charge. Let's see, are we accustomed to this formula yet? Divided by A times epsilon zero. So how much charge is enclosed inside of this I guess you would refer to this as a rectangular prism. So this, th this region right here, we grabbed some charge. And the amount of charge that we grabbed is equal to rho sub s times s. So you take the surface charge density, you multiply it by the surface area. That's the amount of charge that we have. Divided by, what is the surface area that we need to worry about? Well, we don't need to worry about the left, the right, the, the back, or the front. We only need to worry about the top, and we need to worry about the bottom. And so that total surface area is 2 times s multiplied by epsilon 0. The, uh, the s's are going to cancel, and we're left with rho sub s over 2 epsilon 0. And I don't know whether you remember this, but in lesson 4, we derived that, that result two different ways. And both of them were a giant pain in the neck. Uh, this time we derived it exactly the same result, and it is the correct result, and we derived it in a much, much simpler manner. Let's consider now what happens if you have uh, uh, two parallel uh, infinite planes. Again, these are infinite planes. If they weren't infinite, then the electric fields wouldn't be perfectly perpendicular. Uh, the top plate has plus 2 coulombs per square meter. The bottom plate has minus 2 coulombs per square meter. And that means that the electric fields are going to be po pointing straight from the top plate down to the bottom plate. Uh, and, and then the question is, what is the electric field uh, inside, in between those two infinite plates? Well, I'm going to first off prove that there is no electric field outside. You know what? Let's do this one as a circle just to make our lives a little bit easier. And so you could see that it is, in fact, able to use any shape. Now, once again, although that, that wall is a little bit diagonal, it's not intended to be, I've got a surface area on the top. I've got a surface area on the bottom. I'm going to penetrate a portion of the top and a portion of the bottom, which is also equal to S. So the question is, what is the electric field? Well, there's no electric field on the sides. There's only going to be an electric field potentially on the top and on the bottom. Well, the electric field is equal to the enclosed charge divided by A times epsilon zero. How much charge is enclosed inside of this volume? It's S times rho sub S for the top plate plus S times minus rho sub S for the bottom plate divided by 2S times epsilon zero. But these cancel, and the electric field is equal to zero. 
Once again, it's a result that's more profound than it may seem. That means that everywhere, everywhere outside of these plates, the electric field is equal to zero. There is no electric field anywhere outside of the plates. We know there will be an electric field inside, but we also now know that there's no electric field outside. Let's take another surface. I'm going to take this surface here. And it's not going to go through all the way. It's just going to go into the middle like this. And this is S, and this is S, and this is S. Well, now the electric field is the enclosed charge divided by A times epsilon zero. And the, um, the uh, enclosed, whoops, the enclosed charge is going to just be on the top plate. So this is going to be rho sub S times S divided by what is the, the surface area that we need to worry about? Well, we know that there is no electric field on the top. There is no electric field on the sides. It's only this region right here that we need to worry about. So the total surface area that we, that we need to, to calculate is for S times epsilon zero. The S's cancel, and this is rho sub S over epsilon zero. And that will, in fact, be the electric field inside a pair of parallel plates. Notice that our previous result was rho sub s over 2 epsilon 0, or 1 half rho sub s over epsilon 0. So you could say that half of this is from the top plate, and half of this is from the bottom plate. And you could use superposition to calculate those electric fields. OK, and then the last calculation for today, we're going to talk a little bit about a, a cylinder. So now we have an infinitely long hollow cylinder of radius a. So I have here a cylinder and the radius is a. And I'm going to show the length is sort of going off in the distance there. And I want to know outside of an infinitely long hollow cylinder. So I'm going to draw my, my Gaussian surface here. And it kind of goes off like this. And I need to close this surface because it needs to be a Gaussian surface. It needs to be a closed surface. Oh, those were horrible. So it needs to be a closed Gaussian surface. So I'm going to go ahead and capture a portion of this charge. Uh, how long is this going to be? I'll call it scripty L. And the radius here is going to be, uh, oh, I'm going to call this rho, because I'm going to be using cylindrical coordinates. And rho is the variable for that in cylindrical coordinates. Uh, and what is, the, what is the charge density? Well, the charge density on this sphere is actually a linear charge density, rho sub L. OK, we're still going to use the same equation. E equals enclosed charge divided by A times epsilon 0. What is the enclosed charge? Well, it's rho sub L times scripty L. However long this is, we know that if we multiply this rho sub L by this L, we're going to get the total charge enclosed. What is the area? Well, let me just take, take a minute here and say the area of the sides of a cylinder, not the area of the ends of the cylinder. But because this is an infinitely long hollow cylinder, we know that the electric fields are going to be pointing outward. And since they're pointing outward in every direction, they're perpendicular to the ends, or they're, they're parallel to the ends. And so therefore, we don't need to worry about the ends. This is 2 pi r times l. So this will be 2 pi, and I use rho here to represent that radius, times l times epsilon 0. And the l's cancel, and I'm left with rho sub l over 2 pi rho epsilon 0. And that is the, the electric field near, not necessarily near, it's an electric field in the vicinity of an infinitely long hollow cylinder with a linear charge density of rho sub l. What's the electric field inside the cylinder? It's equal to 0 for the same reason that it was when we did the same calculation for a sphere. So that wraps it up for today. The summary is uh, you've got, you got surface integrals and closed surface integrals. You have the ability to calculate the divergence. We have the point form and integral form of Gauss's law. And then we have the important form of Gauss's law. This one right here is the one that we're going to use both today and next time to calculate the electric fields in the vicinity of a wide variety of highly symmetric electric charge densities.